Good evening to all. Today, the Department of History Bethune College, in collaboration with IQAC Bethune College, has organized a webinar titled Concerns of Historians and Journalists on Pandemic, Past and Present. Now, before the inauguration of the session, I would like to draw the attention of the participants on some important points. Uh, please note that after the speakers have finished their speech, there will be a question and answer session. Participants are requested to write their queries in the chat box only, and it will be available almost at the end of the second speaker's presentation and the link for the feedback forms shall be provided to the participants. It will also be provided in YouTube chat. So please fill up the forms uh, carefully and completely on the basis of which individual certificates will be provided to you. And uh, uh, the most important thing is that mute your microphone and switch off your video to enjoy the session. Do not write unnecessary messages in the chat box. Now I requested our respected principal, Madam, Dr. Krishna Roy to inaugurate and to deliver the welcome speech. The over to principal, Madam. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. So, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to address this special webinar entitled Concerns of Historians and Journalists on Pandemic, Past and Present. We have already heard that this webinar has been arranged by Department of History in collaboration with Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Bethune College. Uh, so on behalf of Bethune College, I welcome all the participants, the students, faculty members of our college, other institutions, our alumni, and other interested listeners. And I cordially welcome our speakers uh, of today, Dr. Shati Bhattacharya, Senior Assistant Editor, Journalist, Author, and Researcher and writer of several books. Personally, I am an avid reader of her writings. And I also welcome Dr. Shobhushachi Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Department of History, Kulani University. You know, Bethun College has already arranged for a number of webinars during this lockdown period. And many of the webinars are uh, dedicated to the etiology of the disease as well as the medical uh, measures, how to combat with this disease, how to maintain social distance, the socioeconomic effect of this lockdown period, and many other things. But what I consider this webinar is a special kind of lens through which we can see the history of pandemic as well as pending pandemic of today. We are all fighting against an invisible uh, organism. But the problem is uh, we, are, <coughs> uh, we are not sure when the pandemic will be over. But our old experience has uh, taught us that this is not a new one. The world has witnessed several pandemics in its long history. For every biology student, there's a common term, biological outbreak, which means sudden increase in occurrence of a disease in a particular time and in a particular place. It may affect a small localized area then it is known as endemic. If it has impact upon bigger area affecting larger people, it becomes epidemic. 
and it affects if it affects globally then it becomes pandemic the word pandemic has its root from greek words pan mean meaning all and demos people we usually uh, or incorrectly use this pandemic the word pandemic in several situations now it is i find a particular term, term in bengali otimari which is not common um which i have never heard before but what we have heard that is mahamari or moro and all these things if we go through the bengali literature during rabindranath uh, time of rabindranath sharad chandra or bokhi chandra we have heard about ola otha that is cholera or plague or boshunto that is smallpox all these things so this pandemic uh, this occurrence of pandemic was in our country as well as in other countries and if we uh, if we go through the history of pandemic world pandemics pandemic means it affects the world uh, we can uh, have the data of uh, three important pandemics in the last three or four centuries the first one i can say the great bubonic plague of marseille in from 1720 to 23 that means it lasted for four years and <clears throat> many people died in this situation the second one which affected our country especially calcutta also first cholera pandemic which is also known as asiatic cholera and it lasted from 1817 to 1824 So almost seven years, and then in the nineteen eighteen to nineteen twenty, that was famous Spanish flu, which often we compare with this uh, COVID nineteen with Spanish flu all the times. And we also come across another term that is quarantine, and this is very loosely used. That means uh, quarantine is for fourteen days. Those who are from biology, they know that. um quarantine some diseases are considered as quarantine disease and for which uh, quarantine leave is admitted and it is, this is for 14 years but initially or originally the period quarantine lasted for 40 days and it began in 14th century uh, specially uh, to control plague and the sheep the sheep were allowed to stay in isolated area uh, far beyond the coastal area so that the coastal cities are not affected and the sheep were allowed to stay there for about 40 days so this is the basic of pandemic and the term quarantine and there are many other uh, small epidemics in the last century and we can remember asian flu of 1957 uh, which was due to influenza virus then hong kong flu 1968 then hiv and aids which is though these are considered as manageable and chronic disease then sars 2002 then swine flu 2009 then mars 2012 ebola outbreak 2014 so all this epidemic and an endemic and sorry pandemic are going side by side and we have to endure all these problems if we survive we will enter into a new world so each pandemic has taught the civilization a new uh, technology new la- meaning of new life so much so uh, we are having with us two very distinguished speakers and we will be enlightened with their uh, speech and i hope everybody will enjoy today's webinar thank you thank you madam quarantine and lockdown are actually two key terms that shape our existence today around the world they signify a halt on all regular activities especially our essential need to socialize as humans in this moment of crisis people have been faced with a challenging question preservation of human life or economic stability which of the two is more important in our modern society different segments of society from industrialists businessmen to daily wage earners and migrant laborers are reacting from varied perspectives the world media 
has been flooding us with latest information, guidelines, comments, and harrowing first-hand accounts of medical staff and first responders who are constantly risking their lives and trying their utmost, even with the lack of appropriate infrastructure and administrative guidance. The administration has failed to empathize with the plight of the common man during this pandemic, and the sense of helplessness and anguish in the face of this crisis has been insurmountable. Human beings all over the world have been caught up in a labyrinth of accurate and false news popping up daily on social media. Overwhelming as it may be, people still have little pockets of hope for a better future. However, a pandemic is not new to us. Over this long period of human existence, diseases have wreaked havoc in society. Even some 5,000 years ago, when a prehistoric village in China first recorded an pandemic. In recent years, we have also lived through Ebola, swine flu, and now COVID-19. Thus, we shall continue to remind ourselves that a pandemic is not just defined by incidents of crisis and destruction, but also by recovery and rejuvenation. Now, today our esteemed speakers, Dr. Shobhoshachi Chattopadhyay and Dr. Swati Bhattacharji are going to enrich us with their knowledge on the history of pandemics in the light of the present perspective and to look at it through the eyes of media. Our first speaker in the session is the eminent scholar and historian, Dr. Shobhoshachi Chattopadhyay from the University of Kolani, who specialized in the history of science, technology, environment, and medicine. Presently, he's working on historiography of STEM and history of secular scientific culture of Indian subcontinent. He shall speak on contemporary concerns on past pandemics. Now over to Dr. Chattopal. At the very beginning, I would like to thank the authorities of Bethun College for inviting me to speak in this webinar. Uh, the title of the webinar, as you already mentioned, that uh, concerns of uh, historians and journalists on the pandemic, past and present. Uh, now, I am a practicing historian in the sense that I teach history, but I doubt whether I am uh, eligible enough to represent the historian's camp. I am a teacher of history and I do humble research on the history of science, technology, environment, and medicine. My area of study is mainly contemporary history. However, the present pandemic situation has compelled me, like most of you, as Honorable Principal and the Head of the Department of History has already mentioned that uh, the present situation in which we are living. So we, have, we are compelled to trace the history of the pandemic. Thus, what I would like to speak on, the historical outline of the past, as I have been requested by the organizers, now, these are uh, mere facts, some of which has already been mentioned by the Honorable Principal Man. If the views is concerned, I think I have to highlight the history of last four or five months. Uh, the students of history must know that all major events have both immediate and far reaching effect on history. And the pandemic caused by COVID-19 is not an exceptional one. Uh, uh, however, in this webinar, we have a renowned scribe who will speak on the contemporary history and its multidimensionality in her presentation titled Covering COVID. 
because I would like to confine myself in the past, that is the past pandemics. Now, before starting, uh, I what I would like to say that I'd be happy if I present this uh, lecture in front of the physical audience in an auditorium of Bethune College, but that is not possible in this situation. And at the very beginning, I would like to record my connection with Bethune College. After receiving the invitation, I visited the website of the college and I found that most of the present faculty members uh, were the students of Jadapur University, but I also a student from my undergraduate level to doctoral research. And another thing I would like to put on record that one of the alumni of Bethune College, a prominent alumni of the Department of History, uh, is now working for his research, for her research, as I may mention, uh, under my supervision. She is Sriya Rai, who stood first for undergraduate and postgraduate level. Uh, now, after these initial words, I would like to start my presentation. Let's start to focus on the history, that is the past pandemics. Now, I have been requested that I should be bilingual. So, uh, I would like to speak uh, some on Bangla and some on English. Uh, uh, for, the, for the first time, I would like to speak on uh, past pandemics. Now, we are concerned about the past pandemics because of the present happening. All of us know. The first question which comes to our mind whether there was any kind of situation in the past. As the principal has mentioned, that there were a number of pandemics or epidemics. As she has mentioned the terms in Bangla, Upimari and Mohamari Moro. Uh, the students of history honors have to study the history of the 14th century Europe. No. About the 14th century Black Death. I start with the happenings of the 14th century Europe because the word quarantine is related to the 14th century Black Death. But the outbreak uh, of uh, this plague, uh, this uh, epidemic in the 14th century, must be situated in the terms like pandemic and epidemic. Now, as the principles mentioned that epidemic means a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time and space. It refers to a sudden increase in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected. We can see a number of epidemics in history, as I have mentioned, among those the mention must be made of the Black Death of the 14th century. It was in the period of period between 1346 and 48, the epidemic spread over Italy due to plague. Approximately 25 million people died out of approximately 80 million total population in Europe. The custom of quarantine was started from that time. Now, how did the germ originate then? Is there any different answer? We would be astonished to know that, like contemporary days, the allegation was made against China. Sefket Pamu, in his paper, The Black Death and the Origins of the Great Divergence Across Europe, 1300 to 1600, uh, that was published in European Review of Economic History, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2007, opined that, I quote, it began to appear in China during 1330s and reached the premier in 1346. From the China, the Pasturela Pestis and the plague took ship and traveled to Constantinople and Sicily in the year 1347, Egypt and Syria in 1348, and spread to the rest of Europe in the following years. So that was the story of the Black Death that uh, spread over a long uh, 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 vast area of Europe and not only Europe, it was not confined within the Europe. And as I have mentioned that it started 
from China. That uh, some pictures has been sh shown in the presentation. These are the pictures of the 14th century. It's the triumph of faith. Now, as I mentioned, the term quarantine is associated with the epidemic of the 14th century. And here we can see the picture of the famous Venice, a port in Italy. This uh, quarantine, as already it has been mentioned, that quarantine is a state period of place of isolation in which people of animals, people or animals that have arrived from elsewhere or been exposed to infectious or contagious diseases are placed. The strict isolation imposed to prevent the spread of disease. The period of quarantine was originally of 40 days. Its history also lies in importance to Italy. Quarantine derived from the word quaranta, that means 40, and the ships were not allowed to enter the Italian port, Venice, for 40 days to prevent the spread of the germ of plague in the 14th century. That was the port of Venice. And that was the first sketch of the port of Venice that has been found some years back. It was pencil sketch of the Venice port. The detention imposed upon ships has now been replaced by isolation imposed upon persons. On arrival at a port or place, when suspected of carrying some infectious or contagious disease, that the term quarantine has changed. That is also the scenario of Italy. I am talking about the 14th century Italy. But the outbreak of plague has more ancient history. The students of uh, history must know that in the ancient period, uh, by before starting the ancient Greece, I would like to mention that uh, in Malta we have the, uh, we have the history that quarantine was lasted for. Uh, less than 40 days, it was for 18 days. That is a picture of Malta. Now, coming from the 14th century, I would like to focus on the ancient Greece. As I mentioned, the history of uh, pandemic must be traced in the history of ancient Greece. The students of Greek history are acquainted with the names of two great ancient historians, Herodotus and Socrates. In this slide, we are viewing the picture of Kukaridis, who wrote the famous book, The History of the Peloponnesian War. That book was on the history of the war between Athens and Sparta. Kukaridis wrote the history of Peloponnesian War, where he had mentioned the outbreak of plague. The plague that took place in Athens in the 5th century BC. So, what we can mention that in the, in the period before Christ, in the Greek history, we find the presence of this kind of epidemic. So, the history of epidemic must be traced in the ancient Greek society. As I have been requested to speak on the history of epidemic, I would like to give an outline of the history. Thus, I would like to jump from uh, this 14th century to ancient Greece, and then I would like to focus on the 19th century. That is, the 
development of sanitary conference in the 19th century in 1851 the first international sanitary conference was held uh, in paris that conference was the was first of its kind because at that time uh, there was a con there was going concern that a number of factors are responsible for the outbreak of a disease and the students of history must know that in the 18th century the industrial revolution took place in england and then in the continent thus we find the development of urbanization which resulted uh the the development or the emergence of uh, a new kind of urban setting so and uh, some diseases uh became evident because of these what you can say precocious urbanization that urbanization lack the proper development and what we notice that the concerned people they felt the necessity to focus on the improvement of sanitary condition in england emphasis was made on the development of the sanitary condition and in this background the first international sanitary conference was convened in paris as i mentioned that was first of its kind the objective of this conference was very limited what was the objective it was the objective was to introduce some order and uniformity into quarantine measures which varied from country to country earlier that that first conference it lasted for 6 months with no lasting results some members of course quarantine and some took an intermediate position that was the history of the first international sanitary conference now if we study the proceedings of international sanitary conference that is the first conference and if we start to study the proceedings of uh the conferences those were held between 1851 and 1938 we find a number of uh striking point i would like to show you some pictures and i would like to focus on the third conference that was mainly named as the cholera conference now census made in 1831 showed that the inhabitants of paris numbered uh, 785862 on 26 march 1832 cholera struck the city for the first time in its history infection having come from england in april 1832 alone there were 12733 deaths from cholera in paris this was more than half the average annual number of deaths as i have already mentioned that when epidemic uh, comes the average death increases thus there were 12733 deaths from cholera in paris this was more than half the average annual number of deaths from all causes for the previous 10 years and an intolerable stain was placed upon public services there was a penury not only of grave diggers but also of transport to take the dead to the burial grounds just think of the present situation our municipal corporation uh, they are saying that they don't have enough resources to move the dead body from houses or hospitals the, the situation was same in 19th century uh, paris uh an attempt was made to remedy 
the latter deficiency by placing military wagons into service. But this solution had to be abandoned for two reasons. The vehicles were unsprung and the noise that they made at night in the public streets of the city deprived all the inhabitants of sleep and added to the draining atmosphere of terror. The sound was so heavy that the common people, they could not sleep in the sound, in that noise. Moreover, the vibration was such that the coffins disintegrated and foul fluids escaped from the corpses. This experiment was abandoned after only one day. The epidemic ended in September, having claimed a total of 18,402 victims. Thanks to cholera, deaths in Paris in 1832 jumped from an expected 23,000 to 44,000. In this drawing by a famous artist, Romia, the man, please look at the slide, the man in the foreground has collapsed in the street, just compare with the present situation. The man collapsed in the street from cholera. In the background, two men are carrying a coffin while a hearse drives by bearing another. On the left, a terrified woman rushes into the house, just compared with the present situation. While on the right, even the dog has its tail between his legs. That is the, the story of the picture. Now I would like to show another picture. One year after the first international sanitary conference, that is, I have already mentioned the conference was held in 1851, so it is the story of 1852. The Punch, the famous satirical magazine, published this cartoon entitled A Court for King Cholera. Britain, Britain had then suffered from two disastrous waves of the disease and was to have two more. While uh, that's a slide, this is this slide. Uh, while the nature of the cholera, as of other diseases, remained an enigma. There was general recognition that in sanitary conditions predispose to disease. The title of the cartoon is a pun for the course where small rectangular open spaces bounded by the slum dwellings in which inhabitants live in conditions of unimaginable squalor and overcrowding. Such conditions provided the ideal soil for the spread of cholera. <laughs> was the picture of 1852 as of other communicable diseases. Unhappily, comparable conditions still exist in some countries. And it is only in these that cholera continues to constitute a menace. The elucidation of the etiology cholera did little or nothing to it in its prevention, for it had been recognized long before if for the wrong reasons that the serious shield against the disease was a pure supply of piped water and sanitary disposal of human waste. Uh, now I would like to show another picture. In 1855, Michael Faraday, the great English scientist whose name is immortalized in that of International Unit of Electrical Capacity, as all of us know, uh, that he sent a letter to the Times protesting against the appealing pollution of the river Thames, its water, said Faraday, was of an opaque pale brown color, and the piece of white card that he had thrown into it became invisible at a very small degree of submersion. Punch, in the satirical weekly, as I have already mentioned, found in 1841 and originally modeled on the French survey, represented Faraday's simple experiment. In graphic form in this cartoon published on 21st July 1855. At the same time, expressing the hope that Faraday's epistle 
could help to avert cholera. It was in the same year that John So published the second edition of on the mode of communication of cholera, the importance of which was generally overlooked in his own and in other countries. Although it is not recognized as a classic of valid epidemiological reasoning. While England was the part of environmental sanitation, as I have mentioned that environment, this, uh, England was also the part of industrial revolution resulted. It was also the part of environmental sanitation. The English sanitarians obstinately refused to believe for many years the simple truths that Snow's investigations had revealed. Nevertheless, they were firmly convinced that the provision of pure water supplies and sanitary disposal of human waste contributed in some undefinable way to health. Immense sums of money were spent on sanitary improvements, with the result that the British Isle, British Isle became free from polar epidemics some three decades before other Western European countries. Uh, now, I would like to show another picture. I have already, uh, I have already shown this picture. Now, what I would like to mention that in 1866, the third conference, the third international conference on sanitation was held. It was held at Constantinople. Uh, that this conference was very important. Why it, is, it was important? Because uh, apart from the Anomalous 1881 conference in Washington, it was the only one not to be held in Western Europe. It was by far the longest in duration of these conferences. The conference, the third conference uh, started on 13 February 1866 and it ended on 26 September. Its printed proceedings, we are uh, viewing the proceedings, its printed proceedings which run to 1130 pages are very rare and according to a standard reference work on international conference proceedings, the only copy located in the whole of North America is the University of Michigan. The cholera had that too, spread slowly by land from India. Please uh, listen. The cholera had that too, spread slowly by land from India across Asian states to southern Russia and then to the rest of Europe. But in 1865, it was conveyed by sea from Egypt to Mediterranean ports in Europe. Whence it spread. It was this new outbreak that prompted the convening of the conference. As with the two proceedings and three succeeding conferences, no international treaty resulted. After discussions lasting for over seven months, as I have already mentioned, delegates returned to their countries by the slow means. As you know, at that time, the uh, mode of communication was not of the, the present times. So the, they returned their countries by the slow means that available. And what so they returned their countries. <laughs> uh, what I have been uh, saying that agreeing on certain points, but they disagreed on others. Cholera had been the sole subject of discussion at this conference. But while all but while all delegates were ignorant of its causes, any hope of international agreement remained illusory. The contrast between this conference only just over a century ago and the annual meetings of the World Health Assembly could hardly be more striking. The assembly lasts for just another three weeks and delegates from almost 140 countries come by jet plane nowadays. They sat on a worldwide program and this budget 
and are soon back again at their normal operations. So that is the difference between the past and the present. So what I would like to mention, the relevance of this heart conference on the sanitation, uh, especially its impact on India. In the heart conference, we find that uh, allegations was made against India for spreading the germ of cholera. There was a cholera epidemic in Europe in the previous year, that is in 1865. The sanitary conference was organized to address that problem particularly in particular. I have already mentioned that the 66th conference is also known as cholera conference. It was said that the pilgrimage and religious prayers in British India were responsible for the spread of the jam that was cholera. But at that time, the British ruler was, however, not in a position to take any stringent action against religious customs as it had to face the wrath of the people just a decade earlier during the revolt of 1857. It was said in the appearance of the British ruler, the religious matter of the Indians was one of the causes of the revolt of 1857. I'm showing the 1857 pictures, the poster stamp. So ultimately, the Britishers did not interfere in the Indian affairs, religious affairs in that period. But ultimately, the British ruler had to enact there. And it was because of the uh, occurrence of uh, plague in 1890s. All of us know that in 1890s, mainly 1895-96, a plague took place in Bombay. There was, uh, that was an epidemic. And in that epidemic, we find a number of Indian people fought against and they tried to prevent that epidemic. Here, we are doing Shabitri Bhai Phule fought against this epidemic plague. After the occurrence of this epidemic in 1895-96, the British ruler had to enact the Epidemic Disease Act of 1897. That was the first act for controlling epidemics in India. That was an act to provide for the better prevention of the spread of dangerous epidemic diseases. The act provides power to exercise for the control and to prevent any epidemic or spread of epidemic in the states or country. So in the present situation, we're also hearing the uh, this particular act and this particular act has been used to combat this COVID-19 also. Now, through this act, the states were authorized uh, and this, the officers or the agencies of the state were authorized to take particular measures if the state feel that the public at large is threatened with an outbreak of any dangerous epidemic or what we can say, the pandemic in the present situation. Any person disobeying the regulation or order made under this act shall be deemed to have committed an offense punishable under section 188 of the IPC, that is Indian Penal Code. So that was the first act in India which was enacted to prevent epidemic or to get rid of this epidemic, uh, this act was made by British India. Now, in the 20th century, we find the outbreak of polio in USA, in New York. And there, we also heard of some kind of quarantine. The people were instructed not to uh, go outside their own home. The public places were closed. The cinema halls were uh, closed and the people were prohibited to enter any public places. That was the story of New Year in the year 1916. After that, 
to find the outbreak of Spanish flu as honorable principal has mentioned it uh, uh, it was held in 1918 onwards and we can say that for the first time this can Now, can you see the slide? Yes. Now, is it okay? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. So I lost my network. Yeah. Uh, international health regulations that was published by World Health Organization in the year 2005. Now, presently, we are uh, following these regulations. So in India, when we are talking of the present pandemic, we are talking of the past precedents along with these two important act and regulations. The first act, as I have mentioned already, the Epidemic Diseases Act, 1897, and the second is the International Health Regulations that uh, was passed in 2005. So we are mainly referring these two acts and regulations for preventing this present pandemic situation. Now we are uh, going to a new age. This age, we are uh, talking of the social distancing. And social distancing means we are not shaking hands with others, rather we would like to say Namaskar by holding our hands. Now, there are some misconceptions. Lucy people are talking of coronavirus and responsible for the present situation. But truly speaking, coronavirus is a common one. It is the second important virus which is responsible for our common cough and cold. The first important virus is the rhinovirus. Now, it is the COVID-19 which is our contemporary concern. I think uh, Shatidi will talk on the present situation, the contemporary concern. And I would like, I would uh, love to say a few words on the contemporary history, the history of the last four or five months, which taught us a lot. Now, we are uh, always talking of that history repeats and history teaches us uh, through its past happenings. So we are learning a lot during the last five or six months, the first, uh, last five, four or five months. But I would like to confine myself, as I have mentioned in my in the introductory point, that I just tried, I just tried to make an outline of the past epidemics and pandemics. So the present situation would be covered by Shatidi. Uh, what I would like to say that 
is a COVID-19, which is our contemporary concern, and it's it's a unique one. It has been identified as a novel coronavirus. So we are fighting it in our own way, and we are fighting with the help of others. So uh, in the concluding words, we, 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 we must thank not only the listener of this presentation, but I would like to end my talk by thanking, thanking the doctor, the nurse, the health worker, the sweeper, the police for protecting us from COVID-19. So I think uh, I have uh, made a presentation of the past pandemics in a outline in a jump way, but uh, if you have follow the uh, presentation, you should have some idea of the past pandemics. Now I would like to end by thanking you all for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shobhoshati Chattopadhyay for such an illustrative and detailed presentation on the history of pandemics. Uh, now, our second speaker is the eminent writer and journalist, Dr. Swati Bhattacharji. The focus of his work is on socioeconomic development, poverty elevation, differential treatment of women, problems of the farmers, and the use of media in democracy. Mention must be made of her NBER working paper with the Nobel laureate, Obhijit Banerjee. Today, Dr. Bhattacharji's topic of discussion is covering COVID, a journalist note on a pandemic. Now over to the speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Anushua Dattu. Thanks for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts with all of you. Um, many of you must be wondering, as I'm wondering myself, that what is a journalist doing in a conference of uh, on history? Because of course, media has to do only with the latest, right? Uh, we are concerned with what is happening now, what is happening today, what is happening right at this moment. So what is this um, dwelling on the past that has to do with the person who is working on news? The reason why every media person has to uh, take new uh, history into account is that um, history doesn't only give us information. It also gives us meaning. History is a receptacle of people's experiences. It tells us about the choices that people had to face in the past, choices that are very similar to the choices that we are making today. And what were the challenges before them? And what were the choices that they actually made and why? And what were the consequences of those choices and who suffered? the most for the choices that were made at that time by the people who had the power to make choices. These are the questions that must constantly inform the choices that we make today. And believe me, the dilemmas are very much the similar, very, very alike. We face the same moral and political uh, problems that we had faced many years ago. So while I was looking at the um, kind of policy choices that uh, we had to make here in Bengal, I found a very uh, sort of interesting fact that, uh, you know, this time the epidemic, the pandemic has come to us from China. But in 1840, it was Calcutta which sent the disease to China, the cholera. Uh, we were listening to Professor Chattopadhyay and what he had to say about the spread of diseases from China to others in a much earlier uh, time. But in 1840, 1840 uh, from Calcutta to China, the cholera spread and then from 
China to Central Asia to Persia, finally to Russia, where it killed a million people, and then to the countries of Western Europe. Now, it was not this one time. We find that cholera became an epidemic in Bengal in early uh, 19th century from 18, 1817 onwards. There were repeated outbreaks of cholera. And in India or in the larger world, every time there was a cholera epidemic, it is noted that it almost always started from Bengal. So Bengal was the epicenter. It was the endemic region for cholera. Why? The reason for it is attributed to the insanitary conditions chiefly in the city of Calcutta. I'm reading from a book on epidemics. The following description of the living conditions of cold Calcutta hold true for other cities and towns. What is the description? A basti, a native village, generally consists of a mass of huts constructed without any plan or arrangement, without roads, without drains, ill-ventilated and never cleaned. Most of the villages and towns are the abodes of misery, vice and filth, and the nurseries of sickness and disease. So this was well recognized as far back as the early and the middle of the uh, 19th century. And today, in the 21st century, after the outbreak of the COVID, in a very recent briefing, the UN has said that 90% of COVID infection is happening in the urban areas. 90% of all who are affected by the COVID are citizens of our cities. This shows the horrible condition of many of the cities, not only in the developing world, mind you, of, mind you. Of course, this is true very much of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, cities of Sub-Saharan Africa, but even in Hong Kong, where one of the places where the COVID raged very early, it has been found that bad housing was one of the main reasons for uh, the spread of the disease. So it is very clear from the very beginning, as uh, Professor Chattopadha was showing us repeatedly, there had been uh, so many starting, I mean, 1857, they were already having the third sanitation conference. So they were having many conferences and there were never any dearth of uh, unanimity on the question on what are the things that have to be done to uh, free the city of epidemics. For example, Ronald Ross, who you know had sat in Calcutta to uh, find his um, uh, famous um, uh, identification of the reason for malaria, how malaria is actually transmitted to humans. He found it and he had given very detailed uh, descriptions of uh, directions on what is to be done to free a city from malaria. He got the uh, Nobel in 1902. He died about 20 years later. In between, he had many awards and he had, he had earned much. He was given a whole lot of honors, but he lamented that I am given all sorts of awards and honors, but the basic things that I had said are completely ignored. So look at the choices that we made then and look at the choices that we are making now, which there has never been any doubt that our cities are unsafe. Our cities and especially the bastis, the slums, the areas where the poorest people, the working people, people who live by the sweat of their brow, they are the most vulnerable because they're forced to live in the worst possible conditions. Studies have found that the Delhi slums, they are, they amplify 
flu epidemics several times. In Mumbai, in Dharavi, the studies have shown that there are less deaths. Why? Not because there are less infections, but because there were more infections. They have all been infected and now they have developed antibodies. So now they are partially Im immune. Imagine what might have happened if they had not developed uh, antibodies. If, if this is a, if a different kind of some mutated virus comes to which the human body is not so um, easily amenable, what kind of deaths may happen then? So these are very important political questions that who do you privilege over others? For what do you send, spend your resources? And who controls housing? Let us look around us and let us look at the rest of the world. Lockdowns happened almost everywhere, barring a few countries like South Korea and some Scandinavian countries. Every country went through phases of lockdown. But it was only in India that the poor laborers were out marching in the roads by thousands. They were walking for days on end, thousands of kilometers to get home. Why did they have to leave? They had to leave because they stay in awful conditions where they pay exorbitant prices. This is what Nirmala Banerjee, one of the most renowned economists, were telling me the other day. She will be writing on this very soon. But it is, you know, we have created in urban areas a situation which is not only extremely unhealthy, but also at the same time extremely exploitative. They have no amenities at all. In the Bengal Lamp uh, Basti area in Jadapur, some of the, uh, my friends who are now working as members of the Jadapur commune, and they distribute free fru food. And they were telling me that when we go into these areas, we find that for 400 uh, uh, houses, if you can call them houses, 400 living places, there are only two uh, sources of drinking water. So in such a situation, can you expect proper sanitation? Can you expect proper uh, uh, drinking water? Can you expect a life free of infections? There has been another very interesting study on seven cities of Kolkata trying to calculate you know, how much a family has to pay if they are to access the pay and use toilets. The slum dwellers, how much would they pay? Because they don't have individual houses, right? And we are having this Swachh Bharat where we cannot have open defecation. So everybody has to use a toilet, but where are those toilets? And it was calculated that a family of five would have to pay rupees 48 a day in Kolkata if they wanted to use only toilets. So naturally, they try to avoid it as much as they can. So these, each of these things, which we ignore completely, which are never ever considered when we do urban planning, these are the seeds of epidemic. This is how epidemics start. This is why how epidemics become uncontrollable. So these are some of the most important things that we have to keep in mind, the important choices. So here, what we find is that history is giving us a clue, even to journalists, even those of us who are here now, who are looking at the indescribable, uh, perhaps we have never before seen this scale of suffering, as uh, Professor Dato was saying in her introductory remarks, that the amount of hardship that we see because of loss of life and loss of livelihood is unprecedented. So what we could do is to go beyond this obsession with you know, how many uh, people are dying? How many is, was it yesterday? How many is it today? How many people are going uh, without masks? What are, uh, how many people have the police beaten up? Those are the questions 
that um, finally, do not hold much meaning. The really meaningful question, if you want me to go under the skin of the problem, if we have to go beneath the surface of the problem, then we have to ask, why are our cities unsafe? And this is where you as students and researchers of history could really brief us, could really empower the media by giving us the kind of policy decisions historically that our uh, administrators have made that made our cities unsafe, both before independence and after independence. For example, we had all these wonderful uh, things about smart city, these brilliant ideas. And before that, the JNNURM, the Ur Urban Renewal Mission, what happened to those? How did they address the problems of the urban poor? What did we have to do to get give better housing, better sanitation, better uh, amenities so that they are not forced to become uh, both uh, careers, uh, sufferers of disease, victims of disease, and also carriers of disease. Look how social injustice works, that first we force them to be exposed to the disease, and then we shun them, we stop them at the borders of the state as if they are not citizens, as if they have no rights to return their own homes because we say that they are vectors. We treat them like vectors, like rats or like mosquitoes or cockroaches. This is how we treat our own fellow citizens. And we do this because of our own faulty policies. We have to question those policies. We have to question those decisions. And that is why we need to know why we made those wrong choices. What forced us? Who were we privileging? Who were making those decisions and why? A second fact I wish to uh, highlight today. This is again, if, if the first part of my talk today was on what we tend to overlook. The second part is on what we tend to underplay. And here, I will turn to a part of history that is not epidemics. It is, in fact, famine. You all remember the famine. And I, will, uh, I was reading a very interesting piece. Uh, it's a very interesting book. I'm sure many of you have read it. It's called Hungry Bengal by Janam Mukherjee, who teaches um, history in Canada. So he was saying how, according to him, it was media which actually made it, made that crisis a famine. So what happened was that uh, Ian Stephens, who was the chief editor of the Statesman, he was uh, he could see how people were uh, rushing to Kolkata from the outskirts, from the villages, and they were just dying in the cities of Kolkata because of starvation. This was 1943. But the rules at that time. The rules passed, that was an emergency time because of the war, and the British had actually said, it's unbelievable, but this is what happened, that the emergency law said that no direct reference to the word famine can be made. It was prohibited. You could not write the word famine. So uh, naturally, you see that the government was completely um, completely in denial. It refused to acknowledge that a famine was actually raging in the villages of Bengal. So this law did not say anything directly about photographs. It did not prohibit photographs. So what Ian Stephens did was that in a single afternoon, a crew of photographers was sent, were sent out by Stephens, and they collected a shocking dossier of famine pictures, some so horrifying that the editor himself found them utterly unpublishable. 
Those that were a little less appalling were run in a photo spread published in the Sunday edition of the Statesman on August 22nd, 1943. And in some definite sense, the event ever since known as the Bengal famine of 1943 had been born. So you see, there was a tremendous crisis of loss of life and livelihood that was happening. And of course, as we all know, that famine never comes by itself. It is always followed by epidemics. And that too happened here in Bengal and more lives perhaps were lost. Actually, the government always wrote off the deaths as deaths due to various diseases. They were very loath to accept starvation as a cause of death. But you see here the role of media, that statesman, that one paper, that one uh, editor, he had the courage to actually publish those uh, photographs. And even as he did so, and this was actually the, the next day, even in Delhi, secondhand papers were selling for uh, much more than the cover price. People were so horrified. This was the first time that people actually came to know that there is a famine in any part of India. But even after that, uh, John Herbert, who was the king's representative in Bengal, he was uh, writing that uh, all of this, uh, it is very unuseful what the what the um, press was writing unhelpful tales of horror in the press he he said the viceroy he wrote to the viceroy who was lord linlithgow at that time he says that the bengal government could claim to have made good progress with its plans and organizations so you see that it is possible for the administration to completely be in denial of facts that are happening out there. And today when information has become so ubiquitous, when it is much more difficult to suppress news, you cannot perhaps <laughs> deny <laughs> it, decline it altogether. Mm -hmm. But what you find is that there is a tendency to underplay the seriousness of outbreaks of disease. And this is something that we as media persons, as journalists see constantly. So even with the COVID-19 outbreak, there were many questions all over India in the press on whether there had been you know, enough protection for uh, health workers and for hospital um, workers and doctors, whether there were enough tests for uh, how much tests do we need? How much tests are actually being conducted? Why don't we have enough capacity for tests? What about uh, the number of beds? Do we have adequate beds? What kind of beds have to be kept aside? What about non-COVID patients? What about the huge amount of other kinds of health services? How are we going to keep them intact? And all these questions, even while they were rising, they were a large part of them by various state governments across the country were either being avoided or being outrightly, we were told that these are not important questions. And in a lot of time, there were accusations of the media whipping up a public frenzy, creating panic and asking irrelevant questions. Now, this is not the first time in Bengal, but particularly, this is not the first time that we see that there has been, uh, I mean, and this is actually happening in, in various levels. It's not just that it's happening with, this, with the states, it's also happening between the state and the center. So when Kerala and West Bengal are saying that we are seeing community transmission happening in our states, the center state of it denies that there is any kind of community transmission. What on what basis when health is a state subject primarily, then on what basis can the center say that we are not having community transmissions? And this has happened time and again with all outbreaks of epidemics. 
we all know that in Bengal, we have had several very bad spells of dengue epidemics, right? Dengue almost reaches epidemic proportions just after the monsoon. We are heading for another dengue season right now. And every time we know that there is a great reluctance and part of West Bengal administration in admitting the actual number of the dengue patients. And we know that there was a phase when uh, we had all these unknown fevers, right? Patients dying of unknown fevers, which subsequently we have found that there is re less reluctance, but this could happen only because there was a lot of outcry on media. And this, a lot of media persons, a lot of media organizations had to take up just like Jan Stephens at the time of the Femin of 1943, today also we do it at great risk. And COVID has increased the risk many times, many fold. 186 journalists have died of COVID internationally all over the world. And this we all know is a fraction of the true picture because many deaths do not get reported as deaths of a journalist. They are just counted as deaths of citizens. So that itself is a huge uh, problem. On top of that, because of the extremely bad economy, there has been huge retrenchments. Entire editions have been shut off and uh, entire desks have been fired. It is said by one estimate that more than 1,000 journalists have lost their jobs in the last few three, four months. And there are actually public litigations that are public interest litigations that are going on saying that journalists uh, are, cannot be, you know, just let go without benefits. Now, the question here is not whether journalists should have jobs or not. There's job loss everywhere. So why not journalists? The question here is very crucial. See, just as the statesman photo spread made the Bengal famine a reality. It identified a crisis as a famine. It flagged that issue. It, in a sense, made the Bengal famine a reality. So also, epidemics, when they happen, they have to be identified and brought to the fourth and articulated as such. It is here that I would like to bring up another very important thing which was said by Amartya Sen in context of the China famine of 1959 to 61. That why free media is so important. He was saying that information blackout in China Information blackout was so complete with um, censorship and control of the state that the, in, uh, the state's censorship and control over media was so complete, over any information given out by the media was so complete that the government itself came to be deceived by its own propaganda and believed that the country had 100 million more metric tons of rice than it actually had. So free press is extremely crucial to bring any kind of large scale public disaster, whether it's a famine or whether it's an epidemic to the fore and to press it, to push it as a public a uh, crisis which needs immediate attention, total attention, because administrations always see these things as their failures, as political risks, and they tend to ignore them, to undermine them. But as citizens, we cannot take those risks. So the value of free media is not just a question of freedom of speech for the journalists. It's the question of freedom of speech and freedom of thought and freedom of expression. Freedom to articulate at the risk 
to the entire community. So my friends, I know that many of you, I, I find in the Facebook and in social media, many people say, if you want to stay sane, if you want to retain some kind of sanity and peace, don't look at news, don't look at TV, don't read newspapers, you just, you know, sort of switch off from all those and just listen to music. Wonderful, listen to music. Next time when the epidemic hits you, you won't even know that it was an epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, I've finished. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharji, for an extremely interesting, illuminating, and analytical presentation, which has enriched our knowledge of not only the pandemic, but also the power equations in our society. So now the time for question and answer session, and over to Dr. Omrita Bhattacharji. Good evening, uh, everybody, especially the speakers, for their mind blowing uh, presentations, both Shobhu Shachida and uh, Dr. Shati Bhattacharji. Uh, excellent presentation, both. Both of you, uh, thanks on behalf of the Department of History. Am I audible? Yes. OK. Uh, as far as I have received the question, uh, the, my first question is uh, to Dr. Chattopadhyay. Um, that uh, uh, since you are talking about uh, past pandemic, uh, history of the pandemic in, 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 a, in a historical sense, now uh, uh, one has asked you that, uh, do you think that history will repeat in this uh, pandemic situation? Since we always say that history repeats itself, uh, taking this into consideration, do you think that uh, history repeat, will there be any repetition of this pandemic situation in, in the coming age? Uh, uh. May I try to respond? Yes, yes, yes. Now we always say that history repeats itself, uh, but that does not mean the things will happen exactly what was happened in earlier period. Repetition uh, is not held in a cyclic way, but in a spiral way. If it is cyclic way, then after the whole movement, one has to come to the starting point once again. The starting point and the ending point would be the same. But in spiral movement, we find the circle ends in a forwarding move. Now, if you, uh, if you may think of a spiral binding or spiral book, then you can realize that <coughs> history teaches us how to move one step forward uh, by knowing the past. And uh, the, thus, we can rectify our past mistakes, which, as also, uh, which, uh, as we mentioned by Shati Bhattacharya, that uh, the 1943 famine, uh, the role of state. Now, we may rectify those mistakes in the uh, future and in the present situation. That is the, I think, the teaching from teaching of history and we can learn from that particular uh, history. Oh. Okay. Is there any question? Uh, my next question is uh, to uh, Dr. Bhattacharji. Uh, one is asking about what do you think about the uh, reasons or the causes behind the growth of COVID cases in India? Though you have explained uh, in a very lucid manner the urban scenario, uh, uh, and uh, shall I uh, place the second question, ma'am, or uh, you will answer yeah, separately? Can you the question, please? Yeah, the question is, uh, what do you think about the uh, what are the causes, or what do you think uh, why COVID cases are increasing in India? The reasons or causes behind the growth of COVID cases in India. Oh. 
Well, um, see, one is that it was uh, expected to increase. July and August was uh, epidemiologists have always said, had always said that uh, the curve that has been that we have seen in other countries, the same curve if India uh, has to go through, then the maximum cases will happen in July and August. So that probability was always there. We are just seeing that painful uh, phase right now. So even saying that, perhaps there were steps that could have been taken to um, mitigate the number of infections. But uh, many of those have not been taken, or certainly they have not been taken uniformly. So one, uh, across the states, we find many important differences. <clears throat> one difference is uh, the number of tests. So Delhi is having 46,000 tests per day. And uh, West Bengal is having some 15 to 16,000 tests now. It used to have many, much less. It's trying to uh, jack it up. Uh, the CM has promised that soon we will be having 25,000 tests. But even that, uh, compared to a population, you know, per lakh population, the number of tests is um, very less. Uh, whether this is an important indicator, important reason for spreading of the disease, there is some debate on that. But there are questions of how well we have followed the social distancing, mask wearing, and other kinds of um, uh things which could you know prevent prevention preventive measures uh, those are also factors so there are questions of what the administration could have done there are questions of what responsible citizens could have done which might have mitigated a slightly different question is the number of deaths because it is more or less agreed that uh, uh, infections cannot be completely controlled, but deaths, number of deaths, the death rate can be successfully controlled if we are prepared enough. So that is one area where from the point of public health policy, we need to constantly ask ourselves that whether uh, our government has done enough uh, in controlling deaths, and if not, then what are the sort of uh, policy choices that they had and whether the more articulate sections of the society, that is to say, frankly, the middle class, whether they had not skewed the choices against the poor. These are difficult questions, but these questions have to be asked. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, another question uh, from the gender perspective, uh, that is, uh, women are more vulnerable uh, to uh, to get uh, infected than men because they are less protected than men. So what is your opinion in this field? Uh, women are more vulnerable to this uh, disease. Um, uh, well, uh, if you look at the evidence, if you look at the evidence we have from the rest of the world mm. and also India, then uh, actually, women are slightly better off in terms of infection. It is either 50-50 or 60-40. So more men tend to get infected, perhaps because um, they go out more or perhaps because women generally, genetically, they have a little better immunity. But uh, contrary to the rest of the world in the Indian subcontinent, particularly Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, death rates were initially much uh, higher for women. So the number of women dying uh, from COVID as a proportion of number of women who had been infected, that was actually for some time higher than those of men. And this was probably because there is generally a tendency on part of family and society to um, ensure the welfare of the woman. Women's health is not given a lot of priority. So she is taken to the hospital. She is taken for testing, taken for treatment much later. And for COVID, that can be fatal. 
right now i think the death rates are more or less uh, the same for both genders but uh, i'm glad you asked that question because covid has thrown up many important <coughs> questions of uh, gender discrimination but that perhaps is a topic of another discussion thank you ma'am and uh, another one is uh, this is this to to shati di how much of the total report a journalist can candidly explain express in his or her uh, writing during the pandemic uh well uh, it depends on the journalist it depends on the organization it depends uh on uh, a, a lot of it depends also on the state uh, government the ruling dispensation uh, how much criticism they are willing to take so uh, it it varies for one of the one second um highlighting uh the importance of free press i could mm. say that see kerala is usually acknowledged universally all over the world it is acknowledged as one of the states which has most successfully dealt with the pandemic and i think it is not a coincidence that media in uh, kerala is actually one of the strongest and this happens because kerala has actually a very strong science movement in its civil society yes. so they are uh, they don't care what the government uh, says they will always come out and issue their own uh, observations their own data their own studies on the situation of public health this has happened over and over again it happened during the nipa outbreak and again it's happening in the covid outbreak and the press of course has that advantage of having this alternative figures that they can also publish and report and is it a coincidence that the government there is much more active and uh, much more responsive to the needs of the people perhaps not it's not just one good health minister it's also the civil society it's also the press so the need for good press the need for the journalist to be able to say what he or she has to say and to say it without fear knowing that she might be wrong but won't be slapped with a case of defamation if she does if she makes an honest mistake that is very important but right now what we see is that uh, a journalist writes against on any kind of shortfall shortcoming on the part of the state in dealing with an epidemic and he or she can be slapped with a case of uh, defamation or for inciting trouble or even sedition so uh, this is this is not the way of uh, historically actually this is the first time that this is happening no government has had a good relationship with the press but the kind of intolerance that we see today i would like to invite you historians to examine whether we have ever seen it in the history of this country of a free india uh one is asking about uh, can india develop the hard hard immunity to prevent covid 19 is it possible uh, for a country like india this is this is a question that uh, really an expert should be uh, um developing uh, should be answering but i think that uh, ma uh, many of the experts that we have interviewed whose interview we have carried in our papers and in in tv reports they say that they're hopeful that herd, herd immunity will happen and that this many of them think in fact that this is the only way because how many people can you vaccinate and uh, yes. how much time will it take for the vaccine to come to be available i mean to be manufactured and be available to a national program it's huge money and a lot of time so we are really hoping for herd immunity now at the same time the there is not enough healthcare infrastructure to provide uh, 
support or uh, uh, health care to the infected population also because india is always lacking in this field absolutely right. very true very true uh, especially uh, our primary health centers you know the first contact of the uh, people especially rural citizens with healthcare is supposed to be the primary health centers and these have been criminally neglected one yes, of the reasons yeah one of the reasons why kerala is doing better is that their primary <coughs> health infrastructure is better so uh, yeah we need to do a lot more to uh, have our district and uh, village level health care uh, it has to be much much better and we have to ask actually why we are spending so much money on uh, yes health insurance when yes, our primary health service is lacking absolutely ma'am another one on is uh, do you think that online journalism will receive a boost in this crisis in this crisis time <laughs> of the outbreak of pandemic yeah i hope so <laughs> online in any case looks like the future of journalism um but if but on the other hand it is also true that uh, uh books with books at least we see that there has been no great uh, decline in publishing of books but you know now as as a working journalist i'll tell you something that we do not worry so much about what platform our reports and our articles get published in in any case everybody reads in in mobiles of or on facebook or whatsapp links and some also prefer it in print but as the new york times uh, says that you have to subscribe it whether you're reading it in the paper or you're reading it on online to them it doesn't matter so us for good journalism it doesn't matter whether it's online but it matters why does it matter because a lot of people in india still don't have access to the internet so that is yes. something that we need to worry about another one question has to be read yes only 9% or something uh, more than uh, within 10 yes. i guess the, the uh, uh, population receiving the internet facility internet as such yes yes Uh, another one question to you is uh, what role uh, should media play to protect the mental health during the outbreak of this pandemic the protection yes. of the mental health well we could bring you the advice of uh, experts i guess uh, who 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 may uh, give some guidance on uh, what it is uh what is what are the best practices for better mental health say i will not deny that because the conditions are so horrific so stressful out there the news that we report will be stressful to a lot of people there is yes. not much to be hopeful about there is not much of the fun and frolic that we always see so i think that we we need to it's not what media can do it is more than that what everyone each of one each of us have to um, equip ourselves for mental health one thing that media could do and we are trying to do it with our journalism is to make mental health a part of uh, public health which right now it is not it's not regarded as a public health issue it's a health issue but not a public health issue but recognizing mental health as a public health issue brings a certain amount of uh, emphasis uh, uh, and certainly more funds to mental health so yes um, that is something that media can usefully do ma'am another one is a uh, uh, Do you think that media and uh, creating a hype among the common people in the name of cautioning uh, creating a kind no, of 
Oh yeah, uh, uh, that question is uh, is something that we are often asked, and sometimes we ask ourselves whether we are not, uh, uh, you know, creating panic, whether we are not overreacting. But no, uh, everywhere, wherever I have, uh, I mean, in all countries, but even when we look at international media, when we listen to the experts, when we listen to WHO and to the UN organizations and to UNICEF, I get the sense that this is a very serious epidemic and nothing that we say is enough. So it's really the other way. I think that media should try to do much more, of course, in a more meaningful way, not uh, unnecessarily repeating itself. We have to be, we have to do it more intelligently and more usefully. But no, we are not, uh, to caution you, I mean, in this case, no caution is too much caution, really. This is a very serious thing and it has to be taken with utter, utmost seriousness. Nothing is too much. For COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, nothing is too much. We have to be extremely cautious. Okay, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you, Shakiti. And I have one question to you. Uh, do you think that the right to health care is challenged? I mean, the right to not only to COVID patients, but to patients suffering from other diseases? The, yes, of course. Uh, yes, it's, it's challenged. Right to health Right to health, right to food, right to nutrition, everything is ch right to education. Everything is extremely challenged at, at the moment. Uh, but right to health care, let us just say, let's not even speak of rights because we, are, we have the Disaster Management Act, which sort of gives the government a kind of a leeway to uh, ignore rights uh, for the moment. But, for example, right of free movement, that is a right that we have right now. It's severely cartered because we have the Disaster Management Act in place. But let us look only at uh, the possibility of health care. And there are major, major deprivations that we see. And one particularly I would like to highlight is that after the Ebola epidemic, they had found that more women had died uh, by giving uh, birth, while giving birth at home, that is to say through by unsafe deliveries, that had killed many, many more women than the Ebola infection itself. And I very much fear that in India, we are standing at the door of such a horrible possibility. Because already the number of uh, deliveries in hospitals has gone down. Compared yes. to the last three months, uh, last years, the same three months, March, April, May. If we look, at, or no, April, May, June. Compared to this year's April, May, June, the number of institutional deliveries has uh, gone down significantly. So. These women are probably giving birth somewhere in some condition. We don't know how. So there is very likely to be greater morbidity, greater mortality. Also, there is right now a huge uh, lack of uh, contraception. So there has yes. been, yes, so uh, many more unwanted pregnancies. So all of this, uh, unless the state wakes up to the fact that it is not just COVID that they are dealing with. They are dealing with many other life-threatening situations. Uh, we are going to have a, a very skewed kind of uh, healthcare, uh, health scenario in the coming months, coming years. And you know what happened? People are not having their diabetes medicine. They're not having their blood pressure medicine. Sometimes it's a supply problem. Sometimes it's an entitlement problem. They don't have the money. They're cutting down on medicines. So the load of untreated disease is going to increase exponentially. And that will cause real uh, stress on the finances of the state. So it will be much better if we invest more to prevent these kinds of morbidities. 
we really have to think much more actively we cannot go by patterns we cannot go by designs and above all this is my last point but above all we cannot afford politics to remain an unending game of one upmanship and a game of blaming yes. each other politics has to be useful it has to deliver it has to be responsive to its own citizens the at the center of all our policies has to be the citizen whose needs whose aspirations have to be the priority it cannot be the concern of defeating each other and we the citizens as media as academics as researchers as students involved in student movements we have to make we have to bring the citizen at the center of all our politics and our policy policy making that is a very big challenge but i think history shows us the consequences of not meeting that challenge of ignoring that challenge of caring more for small selfish things this is a very big crisis there is no time to care for small self interests no one is safe thank you ma'am thank you that uh, this outbreak of pandemic has an impact on environment and i have seen a number of questions in the chat box so i would like to respond yes all the questions yes yes uh, uh, united collectively uh, so i think that uh, uh, one has asked that how can <laughs> we learn from the present pandemic situation uh, how the historians respond to the present situation now i think we can learn a lot from the uh, contemporary history of the last 5 or 6 months uh, we have seen the what role had been played by the government both the union government and the uh, government of west bengal and here shakti has mentioned the role played by the government of kerala and she has mentioned the uh, role played by the science movement in kerala now i personally uh interested in the history of science movement in west bengal now here we have seen that the political party mainly uh, tried to uh, capture the potentiality of science movements in their own that was a big problem in the development of science movement in our state now coming to the present pandemic situation we have seen that how the working people were ill treated from the very beginning of lockdown and they had to face economic problems social problem and we have seen a, a lot of pictures of the migrant laborers who had to shift from their uh, place of work to the place of residence or the residence but they had to face a huge difficulty and here the government did not play the positive role the lockdown was imposed without considering the interest of those working class people so that kind of things we had to point out while tracing the history of the present situation along with that uh, various rights had been curtailed in the present situation someone has asked that is it utopian to uh, say on the right to health i don't think so but our emphasis the emphasis of the state is on the health care and the health insurance as chatterjee has mentioned the state the both union state and the government of west bengal uh, is emphasizing on the ayushman bharat shastra shakti etc for health care but they are ignoring uh, the uh, development of public health i mean if we study history in 1946 48 the board committee work and they recommended that the public health should be developed and in 1983 the 
when the first health policy uh, was uh, recognized, was announced by the government of India, it was said that health, public health should be focused. But in reality, what we find because after the 1991 LPG, that is liberalization and as Amita has uh, herself worked on this situation, on this history, that the state is mainly focusing on health care, health insurance. Uh, so the health, whole health uh, scenario has been captured by the private enterprises. Thus, we lack the basic infrastructure in the primary health center and for health care. And we are not paying enough attention to the development of public health, which is the need of the hour. And this situation uh, taught us that how it is necessary to develop proper public health. Uh, the Kerala model, which uh, is an instance of uh, the proper developed public health care system and, and the, also the, the proper uh, public health scenario that has been developed in Kerala, uh, that it worked uh, in this situation. So I think it is the duty of the historians and the scholars to focus on this aspect rather than focus only on health care or health insurance. Uh, that the present situation also uh, what does the role, uh, what role can be played by the common people? If we see the, uh, the various uh, relief program, the rehabilitation program after the uh, on farm, along with the along with the uh, pandemic situation, a number of persons uh, of various political lines, social lines, they uh, they done a commendable work for the betterment of common people, which was the duty of the state, duty of a welfare state, but the state lacked and the common people, the civil society could be initiated. That is also a positive side of the present situation. I think I responded all the queries which have been asked by the honorable listeners. Am I? Is there any other question? Amrita? Yes. Uh, yes, you have almost answered uh, all. I have one question to Shati uh, my last question. Okay. Yes, uh, Shati do you think that the private uh, healthcare sector uh, sectors are mainly profiting a lot uh, from this uh, outbreak of this pandemic? In fact, if we look into the case of West Bengal and if we see the uh, rates which they are taking for the patients who are admin with the, for the COVID patients especially. And the one thing is which is striking, the, uh, there is no proper medicine to the, apart from this, they are taking so much money, they're extracting so much money. And thus a business is a, a very, uh, you know, in a crudest form a business is taking place. Uh, how far do you agree with it? Yeah, uh, I'm afraid I have to agree with this. And I was just thinking, how does one place this in the uh, history of private health care? Perhaps Professor Chattopadhyay will uh, have a greater uh, insight into that. But if you look at uh, the last 20 years, there has been a steady growth in the public uh, private health care sector in <coughs> India, so much so that we now have more beds in uh, private sector and at the beginning of this epidemic we found that 70 percent of the available ventilators were in the private sector and icu beds also the vast majority of the icu beds were in uh, the private sector despite that it is a reality today across the country that it is mainly the public sector, the government hospitals, which are handling 
the uh, COVID cases. The private hospitals almost everywhere, once again, perhaps Kerala is an ex exception, but other than that, they have practically shut their doors. Uh, they have refused to admit, first they refused to admit COVID patients, then at a lot of places the Disaster Management Act had to be uh, evoked to uh, bring their uh, beds and their human resources into the pub public sector under the control of the district magistrate. and. Um, uh, so the government was forced to sort of uh, sort of force uh, the uh, private sector to force to remind the public sector that it has the private sector that it has a duty towards the citizens and it cannot just shut shop almost every state very recently the latest perhaps is west bengal every state has capped the bed charge and the charge for testing uh, for private yes. hospitals. So why were they forced to do so? Because the charges were exorbitant. But despite that, of course, we find that they are uh, resorting, that many private hospitals are resorting to... Uh, investing. Yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you very clearly, but what I get what you are saying, and that is correct, that they are resorting to various, I would say not illegal perhaps, but unexpected, uh, perhaps a little immoral, unhelpful uh, ways, such as demanding a cash deposit. Why do you need a cash deposit? <laughs> if you don't need it for others, then why do you need a cash deposit for an insured patient? Uh, why do you need to charge uh, for 20 PPEs when you're giving only one to the doctor? And remember that it's not just to the customer, to the uh, consumer that they are being unfair. Many private hospitals are also being very unfair to the doctors because they are forcing them to work much beyond six hours in the same soiled PPE. And hence, they are increasing their chances of exposure, of contracting the virus. Over a hundred doctors have already died of COVID in India. And this is an uh, estimate by the Indian Medical Association. And, uh, you know, this shows that we have an institutional weakness uh, in control over the private hospitals. Even in the best of times, there had been huge disputes over charges. And now uh, you're right, I would agree with you, Amrita, that there seems to be a certain amount of profiteering. We really hope that that were not the case. But what we are seeing in media uh, indicate that uh, certain uh, allegations, certain accusations that have been made uh, by citizens against the private hospitals may not be altogether untrue. And the government uh, doesn't have any control or regulation upon these uh, private bodies, right? Uh, at least it in has, case of West Bengal. Uh, 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 does it? Does it have? Technically, yes. Legally, yes. And particularly right now, uh, they have. A, see the autonomous bodies of medical uh, persons, like what we used to have the MCI, now the various committees that the government yes. has created, all of them have every right to, uh, to investigate, to challenge, to force them to mend their ways, uh, to fix their charges, to toe the line. They have everything. Technically, we have everything. And right now, in the COVID situation, there's a Disaster Management Act. So if the government says, even a DM, 
it doesn't even have to be the state government a district magistrate can send out an order and say that i'm taking over all your beds and there's nothing that the private hospitals or nursing homes can do they have to comply this has happened in ernakulam in kerala and in a few other states also they have taken over the beds the question is of political will will the government do so can the government does the government think it is too risky which is the greater risk of citizens not okay. <laughs> getting admitted not getting a fair price not getting a fair deal endangering lives or private hospital malik de chotiye dewa konta beshi risky which is a greater risk should we should i alienate <laughs> the private hospitals or should i um, you know just ignore people's plight so this is the kind of choice that i have been talking about all throughout this presentation today that this is where history becomes important that it shows us the consequences of bad choice and you as professional historians and we as media people we have to constantly highlight to the government and to the people what can be the consequences of wrong choice bad choice uh, prejudiced choice that is our job right thank you shatidi thank thanks you. a lot Uh, we had a wonderful uh, question and answer session and now i would like to uh, ask anushwadi uh, to put an end to this uh, webinar by uh, delivering the vote of thanks so at the beginning of my speech i want to share on the behalf of my department feelings of gratitude and thanks to the speakers of today's seminar webinar sorry let us all give them a big round of applause now we are especially thankful to our principal dr krishna roy for facilitating today's webinar in addition we are thankful to the iqsc coordinator dr komal kanti shom for all his cooperation thanks to all the students of my college along with the students and colleagues who have joined in from other colleges our special thanks go to mr akash mondol for his technical support without which the webinar couldn't be a success thanks to all my departmental colleagues amrita bakchi for coordination nivedita chakraborty for showing her artistic acumen in uh, designing the webinar's flyer chirantoni dash and ishani choudhury for their invaluable backroom support so at the end of the session let us all begin with a fresh approach and journey to counter covid-19 so from the bottom of my heart i wish all of you for a better future thank you